So thank you all for coming tonight uh, to this salon named How to Build a Quantum Internet with Michel Rey. Um, so Michel Rey, uh, who is with us today, is a mathematician. Uh, she's addressing questions in quantum physics. Uh, she's the founder of Turing, which is developing portable quantum hard drives. Um, so Michel, you are an American entrepreneur. Uh, you're a founder and a CEO. Uh, you're also addressing uh, questions pertaining to, to quantum physics. What do you want people uh, in this community to know since it's the first time, I think, you come to one of our salons? Uh, could you please introduce yourself like a little bit uh, uh, with what matters to you, you know, to, to this community? Sure, sure. I am... Um... Uh, well, uh, I uh, was a graduate student uh, at Columbia, I suppose, at a time when the Poincaré conjecture was was just uh, uh, being solved, and that was very exciting for me um, to be a student at that time. I, I uh, studied geometric analysis and geometric PDEs, um, and uh, I uh, went on to uh, work later for Victor Niederhofer uh, as a trader. And um, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, after, after building trading models there, uh, founded Turing. And uh, I'd love to tell you guys about what we've been up to. Um, it started with a bunch of mathematicians uh, uh, between New York and Berkeley. Uh, and we, we have uh, been looking at basically all of the uh, quantum computing architectures and, and in some cases had, had co-developed them uh, originally. Uh, so these are these are pretty exciting times for the field. And um, uh, what else? I, I, this is the first time uh, uh, this content is being shared publicly. So I, I'm uh, happy to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, yeah. So I, I should say I, I'm not a futurist, uh, maybe in the tradition of, of, of some of the people in the community, but uh, I am a technologist and everything, uh, everything I'm going to share is based on existing prototypes and uh, first principles analysis that we've, we've done. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much for sharing what you're about to share with us tonight. We're super excited because uh, indeed, like I haven't been able to find like you know, I feel it's been like pretty uh, under the radar. So it's very exciting, you know, for our community um, to to have you here tonight, like really. Um, so when we talked about this salon uh, and how it would look like the two of us, um, we talked about um, like discussing how like to build a uh, quantum internet with the same latency as our current internet. Um, and then we went through a few uh, items that uh, you said you would be excited to discuss uh, with this community because, you know, we have a pretty, usually like this community is pretty uh, awesome and rich uh, in terms of participation. And so the things um, that seemed like interesting points of uh, discussions were uh, error correction, um, digital error correction, quantum memory times, a uh, qubit resource comparison between quantum memories um, made by Turing. Uh, what will it take to make this a real industry and uh, why Amazon benchmarks model is not your friend. Um, so those are, of course, a few of the items. The way uh, this discussion is going to look like is um, Michelle is going to give us an intro presentation, I believe, and afterward, we'll dive uh, into a nice uh, Q&A and um, I will just help like uh, with Dan here facilitate uh, the, the, the Q&A and uh, Michelle will see like um, how you want to interact with everyone. So um, if you feel uh, ready, uh, feel free to share your screen and let's get into it. Great. Thanks. Oh. And while uh, you're getting that ready, everyone, uh, as usual, you know, you can send your questions in the Zoom chat with marking them with a queue at the beginning. Uh, uh, and yeah, and we'll take them uh, when the time comes. Okay, so 
Uh, title of the talk are, is Quantum Hard Drives for Distributed Long Distance Communication. And um, it'll be uh, somewhat of an unconventional talk, but uh, I, um, I hope that uh, ultimately uh, these arguments make sense. Um, let's see, this is, there we go. So um, I, I sort of wanted to dedicate the talk to um, Freeman Dyson, who I'm sure everyone in this community knows. Um, uh, we had the great privilege to whiteboard with him and, um, you know, uh, among other things, he um, spent the last seven months or so um, um, uh, before he passed due diligencing, due diligencing our ideas. And um, so it was, it was really a great, a great honor to, to work with him and try to communicate some of, some of this vision to him. Um, yeah, he's, uh, Freeman Dyson is, is, was one of the most curious and, and playful, uh, lighthearted scientists that I know. So it, it's, uh, it's really, really uh, we will all miss him. Um, okay, so how do you build a quantum memory forming the backbone of a quantum internet with the same latency as today's fiber internet? Um, and more importantly, why should we care? Uh, so, so this is this is the real challenge. I think I think for for the you know kind of contemporary proposals, we have we have two solid proposals that are dealing with quantum satellites that are focused exclusively on QKD, and quantum repeater systems that are. Um, they are they are these local fiber optic networks. They're they're effectively small quantum computers that that. Can run um, that can run 25 kilometers or so um, in distance before you need to just keep boosting it, and 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 these 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 um, systems are somewhat landlocked. But so that, that that's where we are, and we would like to be able to have the same latency because uh, otherwise, you know, sort of, what, why are we doing this? Um, so that's the uh, the context of the conversation. Um, are you able to see speaker notes too, or am I? Uh, you are, are you, like, what, what, I'm not sure what you see on the screen, but maybe I should press the play button. And see yeah, press, press the play button and then go through the, the down arrow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so the, 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 real, the context here is how do you, how do we distribute uh, entanglement between any two points on the planet. Um, and um, it was actually you know, talking uh, to Scott Aronson about a month ago, uh, and uh, we were talking about some some other problem, non-technical problem, and he, he sort of, I don't know how this came up, but I said, well, let's just speak about it. Let's just speak about this thing like we're both from the Bronx. Let's, let's just, just be direct about this. And, and then when we switched to technical discussions, he, uh, he, he said, you know, Michelle, I, I, I'd really, uh, I, I have a question for you since we're both from the Bronx now. Why should we care about a quantum internet? And the answer is you probably shouldn't unless, unless you have this feature, which is uh, that, that you can store uh, that, that you have high fidelity communication that's able to be stored and used at, at a later point in time, uh, which we don't currently have with satellites. So in, the, in light of that, the ground stations uh, will have to be some form of error-corrected quantum memory system. This is, this is what we know. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Basically, the thesis of Turing has been uh, we're sort of so, some somewhat contrarians uh, about about NISQ. Although you know, obviously, you know, we 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 are hopeful about that, um, and and it would be great if people can find these um, uh, uh, noisy intermediate uh, um, near-term quantum. Uh, quantum quantum uh, non-error corrected applications, right? But we haven't found it for uh, decades now. And, and so um, the, con the way we think about this is, okay, well, probably it, it's going to be very hard to find a meaningful application in the 100, physical, 100 to 500 physical uh, qubit regime. So uh, we decided to work on 
um, the pieces of the, the bigger pieces of the ecosystem uh, that we know are, are going to be needed to make these things run. So we focused on uh, heavily on <clears throat> input output uh, issues. Excuse me. Um, input output input output issues, which means like getting getting the data stream into the quantum uh, quantum computer and the information onto the chip and sort of the, the sort of uh, fast filtering around that, which covers. In this case, uh, you know, our, our our first patent there is covering up to sixty five thousand qubits and can be parallelized. Um, and, and the second very important result is that um, um, you used to have between C naught, uh, between logical qubits, you, uh, to, in order to do a, a C naught operation, there was this sort of uh, intermediary ancilla region uh, that we were able to cut, to cut out. Um, so increase, basically reducing the qubit resources by uh, at least 33%. Uh, and that's dependent on on the algorithm in question. So we're we're very interested in in um, in new algorithms, obviously, like everyone else. Um, uh, potential for for larger, uh, a lot larger circuits. Okay, so this is a a bit of artistic license I took. So the, the image, the, the image on the right um, would be, is the sort of uh, it, it, situation whereby you would use um, only quantum satellites. Uh, and if you see those, those collection of the satellites, they're basically landlocked, which means that, you know, you, these, these, these quantum satellites can only do single uh, do line of sight communication. So you're not seeing any uh, above, above oceans of, of water there. You know, the, you, you sort of, this is a little bit of a, a, um, a comic joke, but it's, that's, that's morally speaking true. You would not be able to um, send signals uh, uh, at the moment in between, uh, over the ocean, right? Um, so on the right, we're t on the left, we're talking about this is this is also not exactly what Starlink would look like, but um, uh, something like a low Earth orbit at 500 kilometers, where where you would have um, um, where if you would use the system that that I'm going to talk about today, you'd be able to distribute entanglement uh, across oceans. Uh, and not be restricted to single line of sight. Mm. Having a little difficulty with moving this. Um, okay, so no matter how much I want to, I cannot remove the loss uh, of a photon traveling throughout through the atmosphere. So the point here is that by the time the photon streams hit the ground, there are only one or two per second. And you need, you need to be able to take that um, and put that into a quantum computing system. Um, but there's all this overhead with distillation protocols and error correction. So one or two is never going to cut it. Uh, if, you, if you need to then, once you catch the, the photon in your active qubit uh, on the ground, then punt it across the globe and, and entangle with other systems in order to get a, 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 a viable communication system. This is not really possible with one or two photons a second. Um, so <clears throat> as I said, uh, the quantum satellites, um, uh, Mikius in China was between 100 million and 200 million. And that's that single or, or line of sight. You lose seven orders of magnitude um, of atmospheric attenuation with with the photons, um, and you know this is obviously low bandwidth. Um, there's, uh, it, I think, a hertz a hertz uh, amount of, of data, um, and it only works at night. And um, you know, you cannot store the entanglement. It is a single shot communication uh, system. Um, furthermore, data transfer, data transfer is not possible. Um, in other words, only QKD uh, is possible, smaller keys. Uh, data, data transfer, authentication, uh, key exchange, all that, even potentially up to classical data uh, that we would 
potentially being able to, 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 send, to send that in a encrypt, quantum encrypted way is not possible with this system. Um, and we'll see why. Um, Michel, I think there, there is like two questions that are uh, questions that are kind of for now in the chat. Yeah. Um, the um, first one is um, Steve is asking uh, if, if this is using the method of random spin orientations. Um, and Paul was asking, what is the atmospheric photon loss called? And is it the same as packet loss? Um, so do you feel like um, those are good questions to answer now? Or would you rather uh, answer well, them just the, after? The first question, I mean, I, I think to, to, to address both of them, I would say that these are, these are bell pairs um, that are coming out. There's a stream of photons, uh, parallel lines of photons that are coming out um, coming out from these, these, you know, the lasers, the, the photon emitters in the satellite. Uh, I, I haven't heard it called the, the former, um, but yeah, I mean, maybe we can keep going and, and, and see if, if uh, things clear up in a bit. <laughs> okay. 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 So the, the broad question is um, how do you get how do you get the data rates uh, of Starlink when you have these quantum communication satellites? It's very difficult. We'll see why. Um, so um, the point here, there's a lot of numbers here. So let me, uh, maybe people can take a screenshot and then I can, and then, you know, you could look at it later and we can talk about it a little more in the Q and A, but really what's, what's happening here. Um, uh, yeah, I wouldn't read that slide and let me just, let me just talk through it. So the, the 40, the, that's just to sort of convince people that there are, there's, there's a big argument behind it. Um, so the, the 40 long range bell pairs here, we're talking about connecting 40 by 40, um, a 40 by 40 array on the ground. And the reason why we're talking about doing that is in order to get a long, a long communication, a, a, an application, a communications application that's, that is able to run continuously um, to, to get a long memory uh, state. And it varies, it would vary. You can technically do this um, in a superconducting system or an ion tra trap system if you can move them. If they were, if they were, um, you know, I, I don't really know how you can move, um, move the vacuums uh, and can still get the computers <laughs> to run, right? So, so um, you know, the, We'll talk about what we're proposing here to, in order to, to make a stable system. But um, effectively, so that's where the number 40 comes from. Um, so it's, it's just chosen to get a reasonable coherence um, uh, time, to, you know, memory time for inter information transfer. So these, coming from the quantum satellites, the fidelity of the bell pairs that are being shot out, so, so they're entangled, they're coming out entangled in, stream, in, in, in streams, of, two streams of photons. Um, you start at 97% and by the time you hit the ground, you're at 87. You need to get to 99.9 .9 in order to get anything, um, basically anything, uh, in order to, to get any meaningful state going, right? And, and, and to, to, to sort of punt it in a distributed way. Um, so that just means that uh, you, you, know, you need, you need 2.6 million photon pairs per cycle of error correction. Um, and that comes from something called, it's a little bit of a, of a black magic that's uh, from the experimentalists. Uh, there's almost no literature on this, but it's called entanglement pumping. So <clears throat> you, um, it's sort of like, so we have, we have these photons streaming out entangled pairs and we have to, you're, you're, your one qubit system, your, let's say you're some kind of quant small quantum computer chip, and I am another one. So you catch one of your photon, well, photons in the bell state, and I catch mine. And then seconds later, we do this again, uh, or milliseconds later, or nanoseconds, and we catch it. And so now we, have, we, we caught it in our system. The photons are gone. We have now four pieces of information in the form of, uh, in the form of qubits. 
um, what we have to do is locate the errors. So we have to we have to be able to get so we have to be able to get a fidelity of ninety nine point nine percent. So we do this thing called entanglement pumping, um, and what you know morally speaking, it's something like. It, Reality has there's it, it, reality is made up of everything that's 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 a screwed state and everything that's perfect. So that with a moment when I do my C not operation locally and you do yours, uh, then we check and we find did you get a one? Did we get the same answer? Uh, once we do, all the errors are gone, and that boosts the fidelity. Um, but we that only happens. We only get our that the the, the good part of reality. <laughs> Uh, fifty percent of the time, so that's why you have to do this. That's why we square this, and that leads to you know sixty. The, that needs that leads to the necessity of approximately sixty-five thousand photons to hit the ground when you're getting currently today about one or two per second, um, and you need this for each of the forty necessary links in your small quantum computer on the ground those links that are creating a, a memory that's over a year long. So the 40 is chosen for, for that purpose, to get a coherent memory time that's in a respectable range. So we're talking about, let me try to move this. I, I'm having a little trouble with the orientation on, uh, I, I can't actually see my the rest of the slide that, I'll just have to live with that. <laughs> um, so the point is we're talking about a, a ton of photons that are necessary in order to make a, a viable communication system. Um, um, it comes out to about 73 million um, per quantum memory unit. So if you need 73, 73 million photon bell pairs, to connect two CMUs on the ground and in different cities, uh, you get one or two per second. Um, <clears throat> it'll take two years to get that done. Um, you don't have the time. <clears throat> so since we can't remove the atmosphere, we need 70, 73 million photons within seconds or hours to hit the ground. What's the solution? Uh, maybe we can make the satellites brighter. Uh, maybe we can uh, in increase the power of the lasers. But in order to increase the power of the lasers, you know, you're talking about a factor of a billion. You know, the, the, the Mikia satellite currently has about, I think, 30, meg 30 megawatt laser source. And here we're asking for something... <clears throat> uh, a milliwatt, sorry, and now we're asking for 30, 30 megawatts. So uh, that's, that's a bit of a stretch. Now what's this, this, the case with quantum repeaters? Um, quantum repeaters, uh, as I mentioned before, um, they are only uh, able to be, um, they're not able to, to go through oceans. Um, in fact, no one has ever demonstrated one. Um, photons um, drop off uh, at about 25 kilometers in a fiber optic cable, uh, more or less. Um, it's, it's very hard to get ultra high fidelity uh, in these systems. The best theory we have is about 99% and, <clears throat> and they're quite slow. So this um, system is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's a cavity of uh, a scalable array of mirrors and crystals with integrated fiber optics uh, in order to um, uh, effectively allow for portability. Okay, so here this, this um, table is expressing how large you would have to make this chip in order to get memory times of varying for various applications. Um, so I, I think it's probably relevant to note that um, here we're talking on, on the order of uh, the, 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 the 
the clock times for this system is about microseconds. So um, in superconductors, you have a nanosecond um, gate speed, rather. Uh, and so you would divide everything, all of these numbers, the, the memory times, by a thousand. Um, in ion traps, they're uh, at a millisecond, in the millisecond range, so you'd multiply everything by a thousand. So we'll see about, we'll see what the, the, the difference in the times mean for the different systems and, and whether or not that's an acid and how that works. But <laughs> the point here is that um, if you need, if you, if you want to have an application that lasts quite long, then you um, basically, uh, you know, kind of increase the, the, the number of qubits uh, in the chip. And uh, they behave uh, like batteries, so you would the, the, these chips are contained. They're they're sitting in these cryostats, and what you do is you make bell pairs, um, um, and you you, you tr physically transport them. Um, this is something you can actually do um, with uh, with um, crystalline with with color centers and and photonics. These things are movable. Um, this is a picture of, uh, uh, it's sort of um, imagining how you would ship them around. Um, those those uh, cylinders there are helium, and uh, what you see in there is you still need a computational system uh, and some sort of battery to, to support um, the error correction that's happening inside these, these quantum hard drives. Um, and, you know, you... The difference here is that you're you're not paying to put these these things into orbit. You know, you're you're looking at the cost of of these systems, which I can get into if people are curious. Uh, but it's 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 nowhere near um, it's nowhere near what some of the the others are at today, and that's pretty important. Uh, you know, the, it's an important feature to to be able to move things and and not have to build a bunch of satellites. Potentially, it's a it's it's a significant cost reduction. So. Um, yeah. Of course, these things would have to be start all together in one place. And what you see here is um, the entanglement happening uh, between the these two uh, cubes, so to speak. Um, and so that's a fiber optic cable. <clears throat> and um, you know, you can you can stack up any number of them. Uh, together. And what's nice about this is it creates effectively um, the physicality of what, where you ship them creates an intrinsic graph. And that graph is not restricted to where you send them because you can do, maybe some people in the audience know, you can, you can do um, uh, what's called a swapping entanglement um, where, uh, I don't know how much to get into this, but but you know, it, it creates a more of an organic graph that is definite that is not restricted to a, a line of sight. So, um, if people are familiar with swapping entanglement, you'd imagine that you have four of these boxes. Let's call let's call these two Turing one and Turing two, and then imagine you have two more. And Turing one is connected to Alice, and Turing two is connected to Bob, and you send Alice to London and you send Bob to Japan. Um, and, and you would now like, uh, the, the, the network would like to call Alice and Bob um, uh, to be entangled. Um, they are in different cities and they never started with a connection in the first place. So you do this, you do what's called a uh, swapping entanglement between Turing one and Turing two at home base, wherever that is, uh, wherever that started. And now Alice and Bob are connected. So you can imagine doing this for N cubes as the network grows um, uh, with, with the number of uh, quantum uh, hard drives that you're putting into these, um, that you're putting into these boxes. So this is uh, more or less an explanation um, of what I just said. The, the, 
this is a this is a satellite. Um, this is let's, let it could be any any satellite. Uh, these the boxes effectively act like they're like as though they're a cell phone. Um, so you have you have um, let me see that the. Um, after you make the bell pairs all in one place, after you entangle these, these hard drives, you can build in a Bluetooth connector, Wi-Fi connector, cell phone connector, Starlink, any, any classical uh, side channel <coughs> in order to, to sort of um, be able to um, find out the result. We can get into this more in the Q&A of the result of, of you know, what the single qubit operation is. The classical side channel does, uh, uh, single qubit rotation is, the classical side channel does not have to be encrypted. And the reason why it doesn't have to be encrypted is because um, you're not broadcasting, uh, you're not broadcasting the measurement value that was obtained. Uh, they they basically just tell each other how the measurement was performed. So uh, that that's all the classical. It, it's 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 effectively like no, finding out each other's basis, and you, that's the answer to a yes or no question. So it's um, not something that has to be heavily encrypted. Uh, this is just sort of a reminder that in, in quantum communications, we don't do trillions of logic gates with, uh, as we would with a quantum, uh, a large quantum algorithm. We're doing about five. Uh, so it's a very different proposition. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, here you have, assuming that the error correction, the, the, the error allowance for any chipset is the same, you ask yourself, uh, there's a fixed number of error correction cycles that you have to do before any given chip fails. So the logical, um, a logical qubit is parameterized by its, by in, in the surface code by its distance, and the distance is the number of errors that you can tolerate. Um, and so uh, here, if you have a faster qubit system, that, that kind of runs the battery quickly, so to speak, in a sense. You kind of, you, if, if, you have, if you have a system that's running gates at nanoseconds, you're using up the battery faster. So <clears throat> there's somewhat of an advantage to have a, a, longer, uh, a longer gate time. Uh, here, but by longer, we mean, uh, you know, uh, milliseconds. Uh, is, is somewhat better. And, and ion traps are, I, I suppose, the longest. And so that would be an advantage, uh, but if it weren't for the fact that you, you can't move them. So that, that, that kind of takes them out of, out of the uh, possibility of sort of shipping them around in these boxes, uh, you know, these large, large vacuums. Um, uh, they, would, they wouldn't be really be working. Um, <laughs> what did I want to say here? Uh, let me, before we go on to that, the, the key material, uh, key material can't get stolen or copied because there aren't keys. There's just entanglement and entanglement can't be blocked. Uh, so that's the advantage. I mean, the, 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 the key thing to remember is that they all start together. Um, and then when you distribute them out, wherever you decide to distribute them, um, then you know it's not it's not as though that you it's not as though you're losing seven orders of magnitude of atmospheric attenuation um, in order to activate your qubits. You know, pick your favorite qubit system. Um, here, it's you entangle them and then you distribute them, um, and so that's all happening. Um, that's all happening on the ground. And, and so it creates this, this flexible graph state, if you will. Um, on, the, on the very left, I, I think that's now equivalent to like one Spotify song. Um, the, the point that I, I wanted to make here is that you do need, um, 
you do need to get these qubits at cost because we're talking about a very high volume. Um, but that's not really um, a demand of just this system. It's basically a demand of all systems. So when we talk about uh, nitrogenous simulations, uh, we're really talking about about 200 million qubits. Um, <clears throat> that's the same, you know, that, that's the same as running this system continuously um, between oceans. So running this quantum memory sort of back and forth and keeping it, keeping it alive and able to transfer data at, at something like 100 hertz. Um, and r running it continuously is this is is exactly equivalent to a nitrogenous simulation, um, and so just to put that into context, this is this sounds a little far out, uh, sounds a lot far out, but this is this is exactly um, the kind of um, the the kind of resource count that's needed for nitrogenous simulation as well. Uh, Shor's al algorithm, you know, when we're talking about experimentalists kind of freak out when you talk about high numbers of nines and, and, and high fidelities. Um, you know, we're not there yet today, but that's why we have error correction and, and Shor's algorithm is something like 20, 29s of fidelity. So we don't get around any of this. This is the reality of, of, um, of, of where the field is today. So um, as these systems, Right now, the spacing in, in our prototype is about 250 um, uh, micrometers in spacing. Um, the way that we can get to something like a more quantum Moore's law, quantum Moore's law scaling, is you know there are several ways. Right now, this is a one-sided one-sided um, uh, cavity system. I can go into a little bit more about what that means. It could be two-sided. We could we need to increase the increase the um, um, the yield, and you know these are these are things that that will eventually um, should be expected to to do something um, similar for these for these hard drives um, by increasing the yield that's possible and the spacing and the densities. That was a little too fast. Eh? <laughs> so this is, um, as I said, everything starting um, all together and entangled, being entangled in, in one factory, um, what that would look like. You know, what, what we're talking about here is, is something like, like having classical data, imagine if I said to you, you it's possible to have class da classical data transmission between Iceland and New Zealand without without a telecommunications link. That would be crazy. Um, but this is this is effectively the kind of thing that that's being proposed here. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that's great. And actually for the Q&A, I am going to hand over the curation to Dan because he has uh, the technical expertise required to, um, I think, uh, filter and like understand the, the questions much better than I have. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we had a couple of um, questions so far and I'm just going to enable um, unmute and maybe Dan um, you can um, pick the first one. Sure. Hi everyone. Thank you Michelle. Um, this was very different than I think uh, the kind of stuff we usually see and uh, I'm excited for the Q&A. Um, the first I see uh, that we didn't already get to um, is uh, about adaptive optic software for laser transmissions. I guess it's kind of moot because you you kind of made the point that it doesn't seem workable to do this with satellites and lasers. Um, maybe uh, Paul, if you want to elaborate on that question. 
Well, uh, of course, for optical uh, telescopes, there's software for adaptive optics. And since lasers uh, are using coherent light, I was just wondering if there are any adaptive optics software solutions to help with the, uh, uh, I don't know, packet loss from the atmospheric transmissions, for lack of a better word. That's probably not the right word. In the same no, way that, yeah. 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 No, no. I, I, I think, I think it's a good question. <clears throat> um, I don't actually know, um, you know, that the sort of classical state of play on that, um, that would be interesting. I, I, I think it's relevant to look into those types of solutions, especially given that this, <clears throat> these satellites are in fact being chosen, uh, you know, as the candidates to create, um, to create global communications. I, 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 you know, my thought is, I mean, it's a sort of a question for the audience. Um, do, you know, do, do you, can you brighten the lasers? Can you put more photon emitters on it? But, but, you know, as, as, as I said, the, the number of, of uh, photons that you need in order to catch, um, in order, in order to catch the photon into a qubit system and activate it on the ground is pretty egregious and it would take a very long time. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm not really sure what we can do about that. Thank you. Thanks. The, the next one's from, um, Ted Howard and I'm going to, um, put it in some context, I think. So it, it's talking about helium resources. Um, since you, you're saying we're going to physically transport these bell pairs and you need um, cryo equipment to do that. I, on top of that, can you also just describe maybe some, some numbers associated with this uh, physical transportation? Because my understanding is once you measure, you know, as part of some protocol, you measure one of these cubes, that's it. You, you need to redistribute the entanglement to it in some way. So it, it's kind of this constant overhead, right? Right. Okay. So, so if you, once you use the, that, that, that's, that's a good question. So once you use the entanglement, you do have to send it back. Um, the, you have to send it back and re-entangle uh, them, but the, that's why, um, you know, make no bones about it. This has to be a very high volume system and, and we, you know, this has to be produced at cost, but the whole industry needs to get, you know, to that dollar, dollar qubit range in order to, to make anything happen. I think, um, I, I think that, um, uh, it's, it's a volume issue and it's an, and it's the amount, it, it also relates to, well, it, you know, it, if you have a 40 by 40 array, um, then uh, let's try to find that. Um, right. So, it, you know, it's a, it, if, if you, if you make the, the, the chip size larger and the yield on the chip, um, a higher resource count, then you get a longer time. So it really depends on the application. And the only way this, uh, to answer your question, really the only way this works is if this becomes adopted, um, you know, on wi a wide scale. So, so that you have, you, can, you have this sort of continual shipping uh, back and forth um, uh, to, to, um, to factories, like uh, basically factories in different country, global factories. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, what, 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 um, what Tesla did with the charging stations. I mean, it's, it's actually, I mean, these are, these are quantum, these are quantum batteries. Um, mm -hmm. so but would you, yeah. Would you say that it's too soon to come up with an order of magnitude estimate for the cryo resources? Because the question is about helium being scarce. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not actually sure about that. I've, I've recently put this question, um, myself but i mean i can i can get back to you guys on that yeah i don't yeah, know but the question has another dimension to it as well and that's about the sort of energy cost per qubit so there's a difference when you can get your cryo 
basically by venting helium, it, it's relatively cheap. But when helium becomes scarce, you've actually got to recycle the helium. So you've got to capture it and mm -hmm. recompress it. Mm -hmm. And so then the energetic cost of transportation goes up by a couple of orders of magnitude. And I'm just wondering if anyone's actually looked at the numbers in terms of you know, energy per bit of running a system like that. It seems to me that as we move away from fossil carbon and helium sort of becomes a scarce resource, uh, that's going to be a significant break on these sort of systems in terms of the cost of running them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, that's, that's, that's something that we, we need to sort of flesh out a bit more. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, next one's from Tad, who I've talked to several times about quantum computing. Uh, he is asking about, um, I mean, it seems like the intent in this talk was, was about quantum communication, not so much computing. And his question is about um, applying the same memories in a, in a single quantum computer. In other words, to run to run a um, a large quantum algorithm with this system, like like Grover's algorithm, for example. Which, yeah, which needs a, a database somehow stored instead of an, or, an oracle. Yeah, so so I, I think that would that would that that is something once this it, it, once this hits volume, and if you we can um, uh, that that's that's also part of the. The feature of this is is to to um, that you can sort of run this as a distributed um, uh, computer effectively. And um, one thing that uh, we're looking at now is, can, you know, can this sort of thing be done? Um, can we can we incentivize the growth of of this sort of system with a cryptocurrency? Um, oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a great question. I mean, it's that that's that's exactly the point. I mean, you saw right right through this is that, uh, yeah, you, you you ought to be able to sort of run run larger um, applications on it once this hits volume. I guess to follow up on that, does that imply you're you're using some trick like gate teleportation to do the distributed computation? Um, all of this is all of this is uh, you know high fidelity bell pairs. And I mean, there's going to be a ton of, uh, of of tricks, yes, that that are that that to make this to make it work in that sense. But but uh, I think um, that's probably not for this talk. Okay, understood. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tad, and thanks, Michelle, for the answer. I appreciate um, for the networking to get the networking uh, protocols. <laughs> Uh, next up is Richard, who has um, several questions. Um, first is asking if the memories are error corrected. I think the answer is yes. That's how you get these kind of huge times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, just to sort of continue on that question, then uh, what sort of yield are you expecting? What 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 what's the number of uh, of real uh, qubits you're going to need for the I mean, size for, cube that you're anticipating, so to speak. Uh, well, for for uh, as I said, for for something mo morally equivalent to a nitrogenase si uh, simulation, um, you need about sixteen hundred uh, qubits mm -hmm. to run this communication system continuously. Um, at at uh, if you do something like um, an authentication protocol. And you don't want these. You don't want it to stop and be interrupted. And you're doing it between yep. between, between countries. It's this. It's similar to, to simulating a nitrogenase. So it's a 1600, 16, about sixteen hundred qubits. Well, that's fairly small. Okay. And, and I guess just sort of continuing the questions, and I think most of them have been answered since I asked this. But so is the concept then that. Um, you mentioned in about finding a new entanglement partner, so to speak, in von cubes. Is the is the concept that <clears throat> at the home base there are going to be at least two copies of each, obviously of each cube, uh, and uh, that that 
that by that later on, if you send one uh, partner of one of the cubes out to France and another one of the cubes out to Iceland, and now you discover you really want to have those two entangled, do you do that by entangling the two remaining, the two home cubes that are remaining? Yeah, that's exactly that right. Goes. So, so, so provided that the um, provided and so then those become useless for any, uh, you know. Well, provided that the two that were sent out were originally connect entangled with ones at home base, the ones at home base could could make yes. those effective. Uh, the ones that were sent out entangled um, by doing right. this swapping protocol. Very and, spooky. And, and, so, and yeah. so these cubes are going to have to remain cryogenically uh, uh, chilled. I don't know if it has to be with helium. I guess it depends on what, what you use, but yeah, you don't need, be, they're going to be very cold under almost any circumstance. Well, the benefit is that you don't need millikelvin te temperatures. So we're talking about about yeah. you know, higher temperatures, which is really which is cool. you don't uh, And then I guess the final, just sort of the business model for communication, I'm just curious, is, is the concept that people uh, are going to have cubes in their factories or wherever it is that they're generating all this data, uh, that they will load them up, drive them over to the home base, wherever it is, and then uh, they'll be uh, entangled with other clink cubes at the home base and go on out. Or yeah, how does all this data get into the cubes in the first place? Yeah, that's 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 a great question. I mean, the concept is something like having having Tesla charging stations that are quantum tar charging stations uh, around the globe. Um, but that Tesla, would that'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's only if this is a very public sort of thing but there might be sub networks that don't you know you don't have to have um you know we, there might be just sort of sub networks that are completely private mm -hmm. um but if it, if it becomes you know the, the kind of um the wide uh, replacing replacing our uh existing once we have quantum computers if this becomes the way of, of, of securing everything, then I imagine it as as charging stations around the globe the same way the same way Tesla has. Right, you're breaking up. Oh. Uh. No. Very interesting. Uh, okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Um, Dan, do you want to select the next question? Cool. Or? Um, thanks, Richard. I think that was all the questions. I, not to harp on the, the pre This is Ben. <laughs> uh, I, I, I didn't hear uh, Dan. Can you say Sorry, I think. Uh, do you want to say that again? Uh, sure. I am. Um, um, this might be better. I, uh, I had a question, if that's okay. <laughs> um, if, in the example of nitrogenase simulations, it sounded like what you were saying is the uh, entanglement for the computation is only distributed through these high fidelity bell pairs manually, like physically moved between these boxes. Mm -hmm. And um, that everything else is kind of handled by some kind of network protocol. Uh, and I'm just trying to imagine then, like, how do you, how do you get all of the two qubit gate operations between the boxes that you need for a given simulation? Um, and it, the, the only things I know that are relevant to this are like measurement based computation where, yep. Yep. uh, or, or there's something called gate teleportation, which I think might also be there. Is that the kind of things, are those the kinds of things you're thinking of? Yeah, so it's, it's measurement-based. It's a probabilistic architecture. Uh, it's repeat until success. It takes, it takes 100 nanoseconds to make a successful connection um, between, in this case, you know, it's, we're talking about spins um, in color centers. So um, uh, it, it, it's that... Um, that sounds maybe uh, strange. That okay, well, it's probabilistic. So what about the overhead? But it's not. It's not like I don't know if you 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 know um, the group in Delft, but they're doing sort of like monolithic um, um, 
they're doing monolithic connections where they where they excite the um, they 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 basically excite the electron and then when it lowers into a different energy state it it it, it emits a photon, and then you can only use this you can only basically use this once it's not an architecture, um, but here in this system, uh, what we do is it 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 is a problem it is a measurement based system. Um, but we assumed for all of this, we assumed only 1% um, um, uh, success rate, and we still get operational gates um, that are about uh, 3.5 microseconds. Um, and so what we, what we have here is a, an innovative way of storing the in, entanglement as more connections are being made. This is the distinct, the, the, the differentiating feature between between this system and and linear optics, where you don't, you know, you don't just pure pure linear optics, where um, you don't get to sort of store the entanglement as you're doing as you're doing the measurement based computation. That's the difference. Um, so that's how we it, it's it's an architecture that's it, it's that's basically inside of these cryostats. So entanglement is being created, uh, kind of interleaved with measurement operations. Yep. Well, I understand now. Cool. Um, I don't, uh, I'll let Lou speak to the time. There, there is a new. Um, I mean, usually we the use the, the one hour mark to uh, leave an opportunity for those who have to go uh, to leave. But Michelle, if you feel like staying a little bit more and taking a few questions, we would of course love for you to stay maybe for like, 15 minutes more and then uh, I can put everyone in breakout rooms and turn off the recording and people can continue and stay for, here for as long as they Sure, sure. Cool. Um, there are no other questions in the chat. Lou, you mentioned just kind of opening up the, the unmute uh, floodgate. Um, and letting anybody chime in. Maybe, maybe um, that's, that's a good. This is a, this is a natural time to break off. Actually, <laughs> I don't know about the unmute flood, flood game. <laughs> if it's okay. Uh, it's, it's already on apparently. Yeah. Um, does anyone is. have a question? <laughs> the gate is wide open. <laughs> uh, it, has this been? Uh, have you published anything on this? Are there materials um, available? I, I okay. We have. Uh, patents. Um, I right. can, if pressed, I can uh, probably, if pushed, I can probably be convinced to put out a white paper on that. <laughs> I think it'd be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do the patents include the, what you just described as um, doing measurements interleaved with adding entanglement? Yes. yes. Cool. Um, but I, th I think it'd be great to get more um, um, engagement, uh, especially from communities like like yours. And uh, so we'll, we'll we'll we would consider putting out a uh, white paper. And also the, the helium question, I, I appreciate very much. In fact, I asked uh, one of the engineers earlier today this question. I'm a little bit annoyed I didn't get the answer for today. But but uh, thanks for asking that, and we'll definitely um, be on that. Uh, Michelle, did I hear that uh, you felt ready to leave the call? Actually, I don't want to hold you like uh, for longer than you feel comfortable staying. So I just maybe, maybe maybe we can take take one more one or two more questions and and see. Okay. My question for the speaker is: um, you keep saying replacing the internet, but my understanding is that these kinds of um, entangled states. You, you don't communicate using entangled states. You distribute keys and things like this, but it's, it's still, or even teleportation, it still requires a standard classical communications channel to um, yes. complete yes, the that's circuit. Right. You, don't, you don't replace the internet. You kind of augment the internet that's with, correct. with some new functionality. That's absolutely correct. You're making you're you're incre you're adding secure a, a level of security that's secured by the the operating system of reality. <laughs> like yeah, you don't replace the internet. You absolutely need a classical side channel. But the point is, it doesn't it doesn't matter um, if it's open, it's secure or not, because you're broadcasting. You're just broadcasting um, 
uh, you're not broadcasting the actual values of the measurements of anything like single qubit rotations. You're broadcasting, okay, did I measure in this basis or not? It, it doesn't, it's not something that can be hacked. The way, the way um, having a seven order of magnitude loss in the atmosphere can be a, you can do a, 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 a basically a, a DOS attack by just putting, by putting a piece of uh, plywood between. Right, right. No, this you know, is, like this really is brilliant with these. It's also kind of suggests that, you know, if this comes to pass, they'll actually be a commodity, right? Maybe you suggest this, which is rather like the commodity of, 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 of SSD or NAND gate bits, you know, it's yeah. kind of, all these people are making it in mass quantities and competing with each other and it's being bought and sold all over the place. Now you would have these long-term entangled um, pair states that are available in little hard drivey things and, and uh, you know, presumably there'll be a race to the bottom in terms of price on that as well as if it's so great. Um, so that brings me to another question and I'm sorry if, if I, you already discussed this and I missed it. How, as I understand it, how can I say this? The, the coherence times or the, the amount of time that the entanglement remains in these, hyper, in, these, in these systems you showed us, isn't it like many orders of magnitude beyond what the current state of the art is for doing this sort of thing? Well, um, a great question. Um, uh, uh, my, what I'm saying is that we have focused on the er error correction pieces to make it, to boost it potentially um, fairly significantly, at least by 33%. So it's like going from, you know, like pushing things in the error correction regime by having innovations there is a pretty, is a pretty big deal. Um, going, yes, it's, it's, this is not something that is, is like going to happen tomorrow by any means, but neither are uh, superconducting systems for 200 um, million physical qubits or even ion traps. So it's basically, you know, uh, the, yeah, I, I, I think that this is a very pertinent question. <laughs> okay, so then let me ask one more follow-up and then we'll go. Um, Creon, Creon, and thank you, thank you so much, Creon, for the question. Oh, I, I really appreciate, uh, th these are great questions, and also the, the um, uh, I'm excited that you framed it that way with, with, with uh, the solid state drives, because, you know, I keep thinking about this as like entanglement as a, as a resource, as a commodity, so that, you know, can be traded later. Please All right. Us. So, Michelle? Yes. I wanted to say a really big thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank, thank you for staying a little longer. Uh, I hope um, you enjoyed this chat with this community and we'll have you uh, back among thank us you. soon. I, I wish you a really, really good night. Thanks. You too. Um, You're in Europe. Uh, also. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate this, this talk.